Lynn Edmonton woman says she may die of cancer before she ever receives treatment. She's been told the medical system is too busy to help. More than 3 million Canadians are stuck waiting for health care services. An overburdened health care system pushed even further. Children are being airlifted hundreds of kilometres away for treatment. A lot of people are saying this is a life and death issue, mm -hmm. the crisis in, in hospitals, but it isn't being treated like one. Canadian health care is in crisis. A shortage of family doctors, record long wait times for surgeries, procedures and ER visits alike. And an increasing number of Canadians in desperate need of medical attention choosing to flee the country to save their lives. But is this just the new reality of living in Canada? Or should we, as citizens of a country as prosperous and as wealthy as our own, be demanding better from our politicians and serious reform? My name is Aaron Gunn, and this is a Politics Explained special report. Healthcare wait times in Canada are quite literally killing Canadians. According to a 2023 report from secondstreet.org, between April 2022 and March 2023, an estimated 31,397 patients died while waiting for surgery or a diagnostic scan, a significant number of whom could have likely survived. But even more shocking is a new trend exclusive to Canada where some, rather than wait indefinitely for treatment, are choosing to end their own lives. Kathleen Carmichael says BC's healthcare system let her family down. Her partner, Dan, opted for a medically assisted death or made 13 days ago, a choice he made after waiting for chemotherapy and treatment. The oncologist would come and say, well, we're pretty backlogged right now, so Hang in there, you know, like, what? But for those with the resources or opportunity to do so, there is another last ditch option, flee the country entirely. I sat down with Donovan James, who lives just down the street from me in Campbell River, BC. His wife is Kristen Logan, a young athletic mother who started to experience worrisome symptoms this past summer. According to Donovan, this is where the nightmare began. So from the beginning, Kristen started having symptoms with her breathing. She started noticing that her lungs were hurting. And uh, so she went to our family doctor and she's like, this, this keeps happening, it's really weird. But the doctor was just very dismissive. Over this time, her belly also started to get bigger and bigger. And uh, so a few months later, we went back to the clinic. She came in with this belly that was almost like she was nine months pregnant. And so the doctor uh, examined her and said, oh, this is just irritable bowel. She just needs to take Metamucil. And so we both left that appointment feeling gaslit. And uh, I was feeling crazy. I'm like, gosh, if that's irritable bowel, that's the worst case I've ever seen. And so now weeks go by and the pain is getting worse in her belly. Uh, and so she finally wakes up in the middle of the night and goes, leaves the house while I'm sleeping takes herself to the hospital, and that's where they found fluid in her lungs. Kristen was given a CT scan of her chest. Concerned the doctors weren't looking at the right area of her body, Donovan went to the hospital to demand a CT scan of her swollen abdomen as well. Th th there's symptoms in your belly, so I came all the way down to the hospital, and I basically had to wrestle the doctor. I'm like, why would you not scan her belly? Mm -hmm. And uh, the doctor's like, oh, okay, so the put her back into the CT scan machine, and that's where they found um, the beginnings of or what they thought was cancer. And so when they started talking cancer, I said, well, how fast can you get her to an oncologist? And, and you won't believe this. The, the emergency doctor said, if this is cancer, I would suggest if you have the means to consider leaving the country, Mexico, South Africa, because the cancer system is so backed up and it's gonna be months before you're able to get any kind of surgery or treatment. Shockingly, the ER doctor had so little trust in the system that he worked in, he recommended Kristen leave her home and seek treatment elsewhere. But without the means to pay out of pocket for extremely expensive treatment in other countries, Kristen, like most Canadians, was forced to stay in Canada. 
I guess at this point, the conversation became, when are you going to be able to get into surgery? Or when are you going to be able to start the process? And what, what kind of timelines were they giving you? I mean, talking about once they so finally had confirmed that it was cancer. Nobody can tell you anything until you see that oncologist. And so the question back to the family doctors was, well, when can we see the oncologist? Oh, it's gonna be weeks, it's gonna be weeks. So we're hearing this and yeah, but she has an aggressive stage four cancer. Like this is, this is a crisis. So we're waiting and waiting and waiting. And it was at that point, Kristen's symptoms were getting a lot worse. The fluid in her lungs was filling up so fast. She was losing oxygen. We're running back and forth to the hospital almost every day. Um, and we were at the point where she was saying her goodbyes. We didn't know if she was gonna wake up the next morning. She was in so much pain, she couldn't sleep, she couldn't find a comfortable position, she couldn't breathe. It was at that point, we had heard so many stories of other people leaving the country, going to Mexico, my own clients. So how do we get you to leave the country? Like, where can you go? Um, and that's when we realized that, you know, when she was serving in the US military, way back in the early 2000s, she might have veterans benefits that she's never attempted to use before. And so we took a chance. We didn't even know if it was gonna work. And it got her down to the ferry. She was in a wheelchair at this point because she couldn't even walk. And uh, her parents drove up from the States and met her on the other side of the ferry and picked her up out of the wheelchair. They drove her over the border and they drove right up to uh, the veterans hospital and just basically dropped her on their doorstep. In this dark moment, when everything seemed to be against Kristen, a sliver of hope was found stemming from her veterans benefits and a history in the US Air Force. She was welcomed at the University of Washington Medical Center in Seattle, where she is currently receiving cancer care. I caught up with Kristen over a Zoom call to find out how her cancer treatment was progressing. According to her, the treatment she is now receiving couldn't have come soon enough. When you're stage four with this cancer at my age, I have a 45% chance of surviving past five years right now. Um, you know, every day counts. It is, it is very fast moving, very aggressive. Um, there are tumors all throughout my abdomen and pelvis. Not to sound dramatic, but I feel like I was really on the brink of death. I mean, I, I could barely get across a parking lot without, you know, losing oxygen and, and just was constantly having to just rest. And I was just exhausted. My condition has just worsened through the month of September so dramatically that, you know, I'm barely able to get up and down the stairs. I have to take a break walking up the stairs. She was so close to dying here in Canada. Um, she was saying her goodbyes. She was sharing her, her life regrets. Um, every morning, I'd, you know, I, I didn't know if she would wake up. And even getting her on the ferry and getting her across the border was a risk. We didn't even know if her body could handle it. When Kristen arrived at the Veterans Hospital, the difference between the care she received there and what she experienced in British Columbia was dramatic. So the VA hospital, once they got her into the system, they worked at lightning speed. She was actually greeted by a doctor in the lobby. I mean, who even gets that here in Canada? A doctor was there in the lobby and he said, I am going to take care of you. Don't worry. And she just, she just broke down in tears because she finally felt seen and heard and that they were going to take care of her. She couldn't get that here. She met with the oncologist and like, this is what we're going to do. We're going to get you started on chemo and uh, we're going to get your surgery in by Christmas. In Canada, though, the way that it was explained to me, the way they do it, I wouldn't be having treatment until, you know, or surgery until February or March at the best. And after she had the first uh, chemotherapy treatment in the States, within days, the fluid started to recede out of her lungs. She started feeling better. And, you know, most people get very sick when they do chemo. She was feeling better. Do you think that the decision to go to the United States for treatment could end up having an impact on your life, potentially saving your life? I absolutely believe that. Rather than having to wait until February or March in Canada for the all-important surgery, Kristen was able to receive it in the U.S. on December 18th. But even though Kristen is receiving potentially life-saving care in the U.S., it isn't without its serious challenges for her life and her family. Yeah, our family is all split apart. Uh, I'm stuck up here working. Kristen had to quit her job. You know, my daughter is in VIU in Nanaimo. 
Um, and so we're all, we're all split up in three different places. Our family cannot be together. And I, and I want to be clear, even though I am covered under the VA, I still have expenses I have to pay out of pocket. This is not, you know, free and cheap well, by any means. I assume you'd prefer, um, to prefer to have this treatment at home. I would have preferred to have it at home, absolutely. But I, I, don't, I don't trust the system at all. How can she ever trust coming back to Canada? I can't trust her coming back. I don't want her to come back because I don't want her to die. You know, it could be going great one minute and the next minute they could, you know, the rug could be pulled out from under me. I've heard now too many stories of just that kind of thing happening. One such story was experienced by Kristen firsthand during her time at the U.S. Veterans Hospital when it seemed like she could continue her treatment at home in Canada with her family by her side. So I met with the BC oncologist over the phone. So they had the conversation. He's like, oh yeah, I'm gonna get you started on chemo next week at the Campbell River Hospital. So I, I got off the phone feeling like, wow, great. You know, maybe I can return home and get, get my treatment going. You know, that's fantastic. And I waited and I waited. So three weeks goes by, four weeks goes by. I'm like, you should really call and, and check in to see what happened to you. Like, why did you never get called for chemo? Finally, November 2nd, I called BC Cancer, left a message because they don't answer the phone. Instead of calling me back, BC Cancer called Campbell River Hospital schedulers and said, this woman hasn't been scheduled, call her. So they called me and said, we don't even know who you are. They had no record of her. There was no requisition ever sent to the Campbell River Hospital for chemotherapy and BC Cancer had no record of her even having that appointment with the oncologist. It, it basically was lost. Incredibly, after all that Kristen had been through, after all that she had been forced to endure, BC Cancer had lost her referral, meaning that her interim decision to leave the country to seek expedited treatment has quite possibly saved her life. Fed up with the cascading failures of BC's healthcare system, Kristen, while still receiving chemotherapy, has since set out on an outspoken campaign to sound the alarm on the shocking state of affairs at BC Cancer and to send a message to politicians that in a country as prosperous as Canada, we can and we must do better. I've always been a fighter. I've always been someone that sees injustice like that and says, no, that's not okay. We need to do something. And I was compelled to share my story and I went on Instagram and shared it and the rest kind of unfolded from there, but I won't back down. I, I want that pressure on the government. They cannot keep sweeping this under the rug. It's, it's too big a problem. I mean, what's it like to watch Kristen speaking out on this and being, a, being an advocate? Obviously not only for herself, because she's kind of got the avenue that she's taking out in the United States, but really for other people. I'm blown away by her strength. Mm -hmm. uh, it's one thing how strong she is in powerlifting. She can deadlift hundreds of pounds. Mm -hmm. I didn't. I didn't know she had this kind of strength to fight politicians while she's undergoing chemo. Mm -hmm. um, that's 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 pretty awesome. I feel like it's a it's a purpose that I have. It, it does get tiring, but I also recognized that a lot of people that are relying on that system they don't feel empowered to speak out about what's happening to them because they're looking to that very system to save their life. Uh, I guess most Canadians in your situation wouldn't have had the opportunity to go to the United States. No, and that's why I've been speaking out. I know that I'm lucky. Uh, I have, you know, blessedly I have this option. Other Canadians can come to the United States to get treatment. I know of a woman who did uh, from Victoria, She's, but she paid out of pocket. I can't even imagine what those medical bills look like. I mean, her CT scans are like, what was it, like thirty, forty thousand dollars a piece, right? So luckily, it's being covered because she's a veteran. But Canadians, regular Canadians like me, I, that's never an option for me. I can never have that. If I'm the next one to get cancer, I'm screwed. Canada's healthcare system, it seems, is broken. But where do we go from here? The American system that came through for Kristen, as many know, has problems of its own. But might other countries such as Australia, Sweden or Japan have something from which Canada could learn? It's a question I explore in greater detail in my full-length documentary, Waiting to Die, Canada's Healthcare Crisis. 
Regardless, what I do hope we can all agree on is in a country as wealthy and as prosperous as Canada, surely the citizens who work hard and pay their taxes deserve better than this. Do you think it's um, the right or should it be acceptable that people that you know live and work in Canada and pay taxes have to go to a different country to receive life-saving health care? It's completely unacceptable. We are so heavily taxed. Where's the care? Where's the health care? We, we, we pay into it, you know, um, and it, it just wasn't there for her. I, I've heard other people say that, you know, they've been offered maid twice instead of treatment. Someone reached out to me just last night. She's been waiting seven months. She had to arrange her own mastectomy for breast cancer. So many people in Canada and BC are dealing with these kinds of problems and they don't have the options that I had. They are relying on this system and it is letting them down with the most devastating consequences. My name is Aaron Gunn, and this has been a Politics Explained special report.